Unfortunately, a very significant number of people who carry a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis are misdiagnosed and they actually have a different condition. In fact, a publication by my esteemed colleague, Dr. Maura Kaiser at Cedar sinai showed that out of all the patients referred to Cedar sinai and UCLA with a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, a shocking 18% were misdiagnosed. But how did this happen, and what condition did they actually have? And more importantly, how can we avoid this in the future? What are the red flags? And I'll also share some of my own personal experiences. Let's have some fun. Now, just to be clear, the purpose of this video is not to insult anyone or put down the abilities of other doctors. Practicing medicine is much more difficult than it looks, and it's very easy to make an error, and often the diagnosis becomes clear over time, and it only looks obvious retrospectively. And I have to say, since I graduated from medical school in 2009, I found practicing medicine to be an incredibly humbling experience, and I've made many diagnostic and other errors of my own, I have to admit. By the way, my name is Brandon Bieber, and I make videos about multiple sclerosis every Wednesday. So please subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. And if you find this video informative, please click like. Now, this study by Kaizy had a very good methodology. They only considered patients who actually had a confirmed diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. They didn't consider people who were referred for a possibility of multiple sclerosis or to consider other similar autoimmune diseases of the nervous system. Also, if someone ended up having a final diagnosis of clinically isolated syndrome, in other words, someone who had the first clinical event of MS, such as optic neuritis, but didn't meet the diagnostic criteria of MS at that time, they didn't consider it to be a misdiagnosis because clinically isolated syndrome and multiple sclerosis are in some ways very similar clinical entities. But anyways, they ended up with 115 patients with a confirmed diagnosis of multiple sclerosis at UCLA and Cedar sinai and they were evaluated by the 2017 McDonald criteria, which are the most up-to-date diagnostic criteria for MS, and a shocking 18% were misdiagnosed. Furthermore, 72% of these people were actually treated inappropriately for disease-modifying therapies, drugs, for a condition they didn't even have, and they estimated the total cost of these drugs after all of these years was an estimated 10 million U.S. dollars completely wasted for a condition they didn't even have. So we'll take a look at the characteristics of people who were misdiagnosed with MS, and they divided it between Cedar sinai and UCLA. And you can see most of them were misdiagnosed by a neurologist, 74% at Cedars and almost all of them 83% at UCLA. But some of them were actually misdiagnosed by someone other than a neurologist, which is kind of unusual for someone other than a neurologist to be diagnosed with MS. Another thing to look at is the years of misdiagnosis. In other words, the number of years they carried the diagnosis of MS before it was corrected. And the average is about four years at both institutions, which you can see in parentheses. But some people carried a misdiagnosis for a long time, up to 20 years at Cedar sinai and 19 years at UCLA. A lot of them did have spinal taps, and some of them actually had oligoclonal bands unique to the cerebral spinal fluid. And this is, in fact, the finding that's consistent consistent with multiple sclerosis. But as I'll talk about, it's not 100% specific. Sometimes this can occur in other autoimmune diseases of the nervous system or in uniphasic one-time events such as transverse myelitis or optic neuritis. And so sometimes people may think that this is more specific for MS than it actually is. Now one thing is a lot of them actually had normal spinal fluid, 32% and 46% at UCLA, and this is a big red flag. Having normal spinal fluid is uncommon in multiple sclerosis. Also, another finding, having antibodies in both the blood and, sp and spinal fluid would be atypical of MS. Uh, another thing is the clinical syndrome. They felt that a lot of people, their actual symptoms weren't that typical of MS. For instance, someone may have very brief symptoms. Let's say you have vision loss in one eye for 10 minutes. That's not really typical of optic neuritis. It may indicate a different clinical syndrome. So a close look at the history may be significant. Now, some of them did have a normal neurological exam, 16% at Cedar sinai and 13% at UCLA, but that's not too uncommon particularly a lot of young, healthy people with relapsing MS, they may have a totally normal neurological exam. 
they looked at the MRI scans and they found that a lot of them had red flags. They called them radiologic red flags. In other words, they had signs on the MRI scan where if you look closely and you were experienced in interpreting MRI scans, they really weren't typical of MS. And they found this to be true in 79% of cases at Cedars and 83% of cases at UCLA. And so a lot of it comes down to misinterpretation of the MRI. And as I'll show in a little bit, a lot of people who don't have MS may have changes in the white matter that could be misinterpreted as multiple sclerosis. Now, a small number of people, 21% and 8% at UCLA respectively, had a completely normal MRI of the brain and spine, and that is unusual for MS. That's a big red flag. So what did these people who were misdiagnosed actually have? Well, if you want to see some MRI mimics of multiple sclerosis, I have a video showing some different MRI lesions representing diseases other than multiple sclerosis that are commonly misdiagnosed as MS. MS. But in this particular study, the most common disease was actually migraine. A lot of people with migraine have small nonspecific changes in the white matter on T2 sequences of the MRI that some people refer to as UBOs, or unidentified bright objects. But sometimes they could be mistaken for demyelination in multiple sclerosis or other diseases, particularly if the person with migraine has other symptoms. And so in this study, that was the most common. The second most common at 9% is radiologically isolated syndrome. These are people who have MRI findings that look like MS, but they don't meet the diagnostic criteria for MS because they never really had any symptoms of the disease. So someone might have a head injury or headache and they get an MRI scan that looks like MS, but some doctors may forget that you can't really have MS without any symptoms. Symptoms are part of the diagnostic criteria. The third most common was spondylitis arthropathy, which is essentially arthritis of the spine, sometimes injuring the spine and causing white matter changes that could be mistaken for transverse myelitis or inflammation in diseases such as MS, but is actually due to compression of the spine. And at the same 7% was peripheral neuropathy or injury to the peripheral nervous system by diseases such as diabetes or B12 deficiency that can cause similar symptoms such as numbness and weakness that could be mistaken for multiple sclerosis, particularly if the person also coincidentally has white matter changes. And they found various other diseases, including NMO or neuromyelitis optica, which is another rare autoimmune disease of the nervous system, transverse myelitis or inflammation of the spine that is not necessarily a chronic disease, lupus, a rare autoimmune disease called stiff person syndrome, a very rare autoimmune disease called anti-calcium channel antibody syndrome, in this case with extensive white matter changes, an autoimmune disease of the neuromuscular junction myasthenia gravis, fibromyalgia, small vessel disease, which is small strokes in the brain that can cause white matter changes, Bell's palsy, or inflammation of the facial nerve, infectious encephalitis, and a rare mitochondrial disease called MILAS, or mitochondrial encephalopathy with lactic acidosis and stroke-like episodes that can cause white matter lesions that can def definitely mimic multiple sclerosis. And one case of copper deficiency causing myelopathy or injury to the spine. And I want to show the breakdown of the different disease-modifying therapies that they received. As I said, 72% of those who were misdiagnosed got some kind of drug for MS at some point. Most of them got glutirum or acetate, which is Copaxone or Glutopa, which is relatively benign. Some got dimethylfumarate or Tecfidera. Some got interferons, drugs such as beta seron, Extavia, and Avonex. Uh, teraflunamide or Abagio, natalizumab or Tysabri, fingolimod or Gelenia, and rituximab. And of course, many of these drugs are immunosuppressants and can potentially cause serious side effects, although no major serious side effects were really reported in the article. Now, I'd like to share a few of my own experiences as well. Luckily, I don't think the misdiagnosis rate in patients who are referred to me with a diagnosis of MS is as high as 18%, but certainly I do see it fairly frequently perhaps it's more like three to five percent and many of these misdiagnoses come from people with a lot of experience with multiple sclerosis and I myself have misdiagnosed MS as well for instance I had a patient I diagnosed with MS and that patient went and sought a second opinion with one of my colleagues who did not believe the diagnosis and they ended up being correct I also remember a patient that had a diagnosis of MS for many years and I ended up taking over their care from a colleague and for a period I treated 
them as though they had MS, but on a subsequent visit, I was a little bit more thorough and I realized the diagnosis was wrong. So you can't really trust a prior diagnosis, even your own prior diagnosis, 100%. You should always have at least a little bit of an open mind. And of course, if you, the individual with the symptoms, thinks the diagnosis of MS may be wrong, you should always consider a second opinion and you should tell the consulting doctor that you doubt the diagnosis and you want them to reconsider it so they can truly consider it with an open mind. I have some interesting stories about misdiagnosis. For instance, one of the patients that I saw was diagnosed with MS for many years, but they actually ended up having a genetic disease called Catacil. And a New York Times article was written about them, and I'll put the link in the notes below, and you can take a look at that very interesting interesting article if you want to, and that diagnosis ended up having a profound effect on this person's family. And so misdiagnosis can really have serious, serious consequences even if it doesn't necessarily directly relate to side effects of the drugs. Now, my experience with misdiagnosis is very similar to what they found in the article, that misdiagnosis is often related to misinterpretation of clinical symptoms along with spinal tap findings and MRI findings. Some people, they get diagnosed with MS despite a negative spinal tap, and that can happen, but it's quite uncommon and a negative spinal tap should be seen as a red flag against the diagnosis of MS. Also with MRI, a lot of people have nonspecific white matter changes that could be easily misinterpreted, and I've seen many, many people sort of trust the report of the radiologist and continue an existing diagnosis of MS, even though the MRI findings aren't really at all consistent with MS. And just to give an example, the lesions in the bottom left are typical of multiple sclerosis. You can see on this T2 flare axial image, they are larger and well demarcated with a clear demarcation between normal and normal tissue. Many of them directly touch the ventricles or fluid filled spaces and are in the corpus callosum and juxtacortical area, or in other words, right next to the gray matter. Whereas as in this MRI above, the lesions are not typical of MS. They're smaller and fluffier with indistinct borders, and they're in the subcortical white matter, but not directly touching the ventricles or in the juxtacortical area directly next to the gray matter. And these are subtle differences that require a lot of experiences and judgment, and sometimes there are in-between cases. So you can imagine how easy it is to be misdiagnosed. You could have symptoms for another reason due to carpal tunnel syndrome or B12 deficiency or peripheral neuropathy or fibromyalgia and have an MRI with nonspecific white matter lesions that are misinterpreted as demyelinating disease rather than what they truly are. And that's why multiple sclerosis misdiagnosis is so common. Now there is a potential technological fix here. Advances in MRI imaging in some cases in 7 Tesla and 3 Tesla MRI are able to show the central venule within multiple sclerosis lesions, which can help discriminate between demyelination and other lesions. However, this finding is not 100% specific, and it has been found in other diseases such as Bichette's disease and primary CNS angiitis. However, it could be very helpful and prevent us from making these diagnostic errors. But of course, the general rule of thumb is when in doubt, get a second opinion and take a close look at the spinal tap and MRI. MRI results and see if the symptoms really are typical and specific for multiple sclerosis. I would love to know, was there any doubt when you got diagnosed with multiple sclerosis? Did you have to seek a second opinion? Were you misdiagnosed? Please share your own experiences in the comments below and please give suggestions for future videos.